Okay, my gorgeous church family, I have a very, very important and special request of you tonight. I'm going to be giving you 18 passages of the Word of God that I don't want to quote them to you. I don't want to just read them to you, but I want you to be able to take them home because these passages of Scripture are going to so unlock everything going on inside you. You're going to leave here today more clear of understanding what is going on inside your belly, inside your gut, the difference between your soul and your spirit. So here's the deal. There's 18 passages. It's a lot. I've broken them up into five major sections, and I want you to be able to read them, see them, and take them home. So here's my big request. I'm asking every single person, every teenager, every adult, to grab a sermon handout and hold it up in the air. Everybody got one? Hold it up. And what we're going to do is I'm going to make it really easy. There are five sections, but I want you also, if you were willing, two or three times, I'm going to ask you to read a certain section out loud because I want it to grab a hold of your brain. And Lord, we ask you today, let the word of God unlock that we can see things that most men can't see, especially the very tricky area of seeing our own hearts so we might stand before you with those beautiful words of a clean heart. In Jesus' mighty name, all God's people said, amen. In this seventh sermon in our Spiritual Gift Study Prayer Chair Ministry, we are tackling the fascinating and interesting subject of tongues. Did you know that if you study very carefully the book of Acts, every single person of the 50,000 to 100,000 people in the book of Acts, every single one of them prayed in tongues. Did you know that every book in the New Testament was written by someone who prayed in tongues? And tongues is simply a very basic tool. It's as basic as a hammer in a carpenter's pouch. So what I, to do that, though, you have to understand body, soul, and spirit. So if you look on your sermon handout on the PowerPoint, the very first section of scriptures, four verses, is the fact that man has a triune nature. And if you look at the first scripture, it says, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole, now do me a favor, everybody say the next four words. May your whole what? Spirit, soul, and body. So you have three parts, spirit, soul, and body, and all of them be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Genesis 1, 26 and 27, then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. So God created man in his own image. God is triune, we are triune. In the image of God, he created them. John 4, 24, God is spirit, those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. See, animals have a soul and a body, but only man has the ability to have body, soul, and spirit. But Genesis 2, 17, in the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So Adam and Eve ate of that tree. On that day, did their bodies die? They lived 900 more years. On the day they ate of it, did their ability to think and feel and choose, did their soul die? So what died? Their spirit, that part of them that was created to connect with God, worship God in spirit. So that, that part of it, was, it's like every man on the earth who does not been born again by the blood of Jesus. It's like they're a person walking around with two legs and two arms, but there's this dilapidated withered limb that's just hanging there dead. That they, that it's been dead since birth and it's been completely useless. They, they, it's never had any use. And so the, they think that all they have is these three limbs, but this other limb is just there. So they think this is all they have. They think all they are is soul and body. So they're just like the animals. So I might as well just live for whatever my body wants, live for pleasure. But there's something aching in them. There's a part of me that's just this ache of, of there's something more, but it's dead, but yet it's aching like it's meant to be a part of me. So that spiritual yearning in them, now that's all section one. If you look in your PowerPoint, drop down to the second section. It says salvation is the Holy Spirit and our spirit. If you look in the second section on your handout, 1 Corinthians six seventeen. but whoever is united with the Lord is one with him. That's a big thing in what? In spirit. Romans 8, 10, but if Christ is in you, your body is dead. Now, that's important because it says if Christ is in you, your body is dead. means your body no longer rules you. It means what your body wants is no longer the boss in your life. Your body is dead because of sin, but your what is alive? Your spirit is alive because of righteousness. Romans 10, 14, for by one sacrifice, he has been made perfect. He has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So if you watch the PowerPoint, when you are born again, And that's what it sounds like in heaven. 
Don't you love that? The Spirit of God comes in your spirit. If you look at the PowerPoint carefully, it's actually a very poor description to call it a dilapidated limb because it's more than a limb. It's more than the two. It's the very foundation of who you are. You are a spiritual being more than a soul and a body. And so you are alive again. You're born again. And the very foundation of who you are has been restored. Now look again at Hebrews 10, 14. For by one sacrifice, now this, this verse is impossible. How can you be made perfect and being made holy? That's an oxymoron. You can't, you're either you're perfect or you're being made holy. It's one or the other, right? And yet it says you're made perfect and you're being made holy. Only if you understand spirit, soul, and body can you understand this. So watch it and untangle it. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever. What part of you is now made perfect forever? Come on, people, you're smart. What part? Your spirit. Your spirit is perfect forever. Those who are being made holy. What part of you is being made holy? Your soul. Your spirit is heavenly perfection in the spirit of God. But your soul is being made holy. This is a really beautiful thing because when you sin, when you do something stupid and get petty and angry, you feel so bad. But in the midst of that badness, you know that your spirit is still perfect in the sight of God. And your soul, you cleanse by the blood. You're, you're, you're forgiven by the blood. And your soul is being restored and renewed. But your spirit is perfect. Is this a good verse? You need to understand who you are. So yes, you've messed up, but your spirit is still perfect forever. But your soul's being polished and grown and made holy. Now your body is not being made perfect forever. Your body is dying. Your body is wrinkled and getting uglier every decade. That's all there's, the, all, there's one purpose for your body. You know what that is? To humble us. That's the only purpose for your body. It's going to be traded in for a better body. Glory to God. Somebody say amen. We'll get a brand new one. So spirit, soul, and body. So again, well, you need to grab this verse. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever. What's perfect forever? Somebody say it loud. Your spirit. What's being made holy? What is it? Your soul. Isn't that a beautiful verse? Now, let's go to number three. The Bible says very clearly, forcefully, irrevocably, that there are two separate experiences, salvation and to be filled with the Spirit. I was born again. I saw this. There's, there's just no refuting this in Scripture. Now, there's actually tons of Scriptures on this, but I'll give you the most dominant. In John 20, 22, if you look in section three, on Resurrection Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, Jesus appeared to the disciples and he breathed on them and said, receive the what? Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, if that wasn't clear enough, in the exact same passage in Luke, exact same story, he said, receive the Holy Spirit. The scripture says, then he opened their minds so they could. So basically, at the same time they received the Holy Spirit, they went, oh, I get it. You're not here to conquer Rome. You're here to conquer sin in my heart. So that was the moment, no refuting, no doubting, no question that they were born again. And the scripture is just as clear as, 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 as pure water in that point. Yet, almost 40 days later, right before Jesus ascended to heaven, it says on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized. Now the word baptize is a really cool word, an important word, because baptized, baptizo in the Greek, it means to be filled within and without. When the, when the Greeks saw a ship sinking, they say it's being baptizo because the water is coming into the ship and surrounding the ship. They talk about the flood of Noah, that the earth was baptized because in the flood of Noah, scripture says that the earth exploded with water from the inner deeps and the heavens poured down water from above. So when a person is baptized in the Holy Spirit. This is what happens. The Spirit of God comes up from within. Sometimes it'll surprise you. <laughs> Got to be ready. <laughs> now, if you watch what happens, rewind, let's do it again. But not till I say so. Not till I say so. When you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God doesn't just come upon you, but comes up from within you, and it looks like this. 
There you go. The Spirit of God rises up within you. And please notice, it doesn't come just into your soul, but also into your body. That's why what happens is all of a sudden in your emotions, in your thoughts, God is real to you. People are filled with the Spirit. They're passionate. They're excited. They're alive. They feel God's presence in their body. They lay hands on people and believe that God's going to move through them because the Spirit of God has now filled them. Although Ephesians 5 says you have to constantly be refilled because our soul leaks. Our spirit doesn't, but our soul does. So go on to the next section, section number four. Now in our soul, this is what gets really fascinating and you will understand your own soul better because our one goal, our only goal, and the, John Hutchins, John and Jesse Hutchins, how many love John and Jesse Hutchins? Well, they're on their way to Illinois right now because John's older brother's in hospice and not expected to last the week. So when you were in hospice and you didn't have less than a week to live, there are two words, if you're wise, that you have on your heart. Two words that you should have on your heart today. When you're dying, the only two words that you want is, oh God, I want to stand before you with a clean heart. The problem is, the scripture says, no one can know their own heart. So I'm going to teach you to understand what the Bible says about your heart. Because the Bible says, every human being in their soul has a mind and a heart. This is fascinating to me, and I'm not joking when I say this, although it sounds funny. It took 6,000 years for science to catch up with the Bible. And I really mean this because only in the last 10 to 15 years has science figured out that the brain has two sides and the right side of the brain is your subconscious and the left side of your brain is your conscious. You can look it up on any internet. The right side of your brain moves at five beats per second. The left side of your brain moves at four beats per second. So the right side is much faster but you're not aware of anything going on in the right side of your brain. It's completely unaware to you, but that's where your values are. That's where your attitudes are. And everything you do is driven by the right side of your brain, but all conscious thought is on the left side of your brain. So only in the last 15 years has people figured out that you have a mind and a subconscious. You have a mind and a heart. So they've mocked scripture for thousands of years because they say you have a mind and a heart but the Bible actually was the right one all along, that we have a conscious and a subconscious. So scripture's really clear on this. If you look at the scriptures, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and summarizing your soul and with all your mind. Acts 4.32, all the believers were one in heart and mind. Test me, O Lord, try me, examine my heart and my mind. Now, section number five is the last one. It's the biggest one. It's that tongues is God and God's word will give you a clean heart. Now, the whole section here is to understand what's in the heart. Now, the trickiness part about the heart, we're going to show you a scripture in just a minute, 1 Corinthians 14, 14, which says, tongues is praying in the spirit. It's a very simple thing. So when, if you look at this chart here, if tongues is praying in the spirit, and it says specifically, but when I pray in tongues, my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit and I will also pray with my mind. I will sing with my spirits. I will sing with my mind. So when you pray in tongues, you're, you're, you're using your body to pray with your spirit, bypassing your mind, calling the spirit up. But then as soon as the spirit rises up, you're saying, now, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to my mind? And then you're really engaging your mind. But what the spirit rises up before the spirit gets to your mind, it must go through your heart. And the job of the Holy Spirit is to search your heart, to bring the things that are hidden in your heart to the surface. That's why, although like 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says, I pray in tongues more than all of you. I do pray in tongues more than all of you. But I've, I've, I don't think I've ever prayed in tongues 10 minutes in a row. I pray in tongues and I pray in English. I pray in tongues and I pray the word. I pray in tongues. I sing in tongues and I sing in English. I sing in tongues and I sing in English. I pray in tongues and I pray in English because things are coming up and then I just then I switch from tongues to English and tongues to English because of, he's bringing stuff up and then I just, I mean, in worship, how can you not? You're just singing and then you're singing along with the worship and then there's a pause and you're just singing quietly in the spirit. Then you're singing back again in English and you're just singing praises to the Lord. So it's, it's causing it to come up. So in this, this mind and heart thing, what is in the heart? The Bible says, say the Bible says, that what is hidden in the heart are lies. What is it? Lies. Satan is the father of lies. And so his stronghold that he has in your heart are lies. And so everything that he has power over your life starts with a lie. Here's what the scripture says. It says, 
On the contrary, God has divine, God's word has divine power to demolish strongholds. We, and here's how he defines strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension. What's a pretension? It's a lie. What's a pretension? It's a lie that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So I want to show you what the whole thing of the heart is. First thing that comes into your heart are lies. Satan sends a lie. And watch it. comes in and it buries itself deep in your heart. Now remember, your heart is your subconscious. means you're not aware of it. Every lie that's been in your heart. Now I'm begging you. I'm, uh, and I'm watching. I can see your lips. Nehemiah, I see you. <laughs> I want you to say these three words out loud, everybody. Say, because this is a lie that you believed. Say, blank will satisfy. Blank. That's the lie you believed. Now, I don't know what blank is. For some people, it's pleasure will satisfy. Anger will satisfy. Control will satisfy. Arrogance will satisfy. Sarcasm will satisfy. Success will satisfy. Family will satisfy. Popularity will satisfy. Money will satisfy. Dominance will satisfy. And whatever it is, something will satisfy. And that lie got in your heart. When that lie gets in your heart, popularity will satisfy. Success will satisfy. You're not aware of the lie, but it drives everything you do. I must be popular. I must, have, I must make money. And so you're driven like a maniac. I must, I must, I must, I must. But you're not sitting there thinking, I must. Uh, the only thing that will satisfy me is popularity. It's just hidden in your heart. It's buried deep in your heart and a lie, but it's not in your mind. It's in your sub conscious or your heart. You're not aware of it. Now, once the lies are buried deep in your heart, they're quickly followed up by, watch the next one, sins then come. Now, watch the PowerPoint, because watch how your heart begins to darken as the sins come in. Your heart begins to harden as the sins come in. Because once you believe the lie, you start to cross lines to do anything you have to to get those things that you believe you have to have. I have to have control. I have to have money. I have to have my anger. I have to have my pleasure. Whatever it costs, I don't care what it costs to other people, I have to have these things. So when the sins begin to come in, the pettiness, the meanness, the lust, the dominance, the judgment, all sins, the Bible says are one word. You know what sin is? Selfishness. It's all selfishness. It's all, I don't care what it does to other people. It's I want. And what I want is the only thing that matters. It didn't cost any other person. Now I'm going to say a line and I'm going to ask you to raise your hand eventually if you agree with it. I'm going to do something I very rarely do. Are you ready? I'm going to talk slow. <laughs> Cost me a lot. <sighs> no selfish person has any clue at all that they are selfish. They're completely 100% blind to all of their selfishness. Mean people are not aware that they're mean. They're just saying, you don't understand what I've been through. Judgmental people are not aware that they're judgmental. They're saying, you deserve this and you, you don't even know the half of what you deserve. Angry people are saying, you're just getting what you, somebody should have dealt with you. Da, da, da. Controlling people, lustful pleasure people say, I can't help it, man. That's what I have to have my needs. I have needs I have to have met. And no selfish person, petty people, Vicious people control it, mocking people. Hey, I'm just having fun, man. What's this little harm because I mocked you around a little bit? Selfish people are completely unaware of their selfishness. If that's the truth and you understand it, hold your hand up. Okay. So you start with a lie. Only this will satisfy me. Control, popularity, money, success, pride, superiority. I'm better. I'm smarter. I'm better looking. And that will satisfy me. Now, to do that, I got to cross lines. I got to, got to push. I got to be selfish. But I'm not aware that I'm selfish. It's not in my conscience. It's in my subconscious. No man knows his own heart. Now, once that's in my heart, my heart starts to darken. Now there's something called a law of equilibrium. And now that my heart begins to be so empty and so miserable, now I have to increase the noise. Here's the deal. You know what the law of equilibrium is? I have to have the noise on the outside 
equal the noise on the inside. Now, I'm not aware of that. I don't sit there and say that out loud. I just realize I can't sit in a doctor's office without looking at my phone. And I just have to turn the TV on first thing I wake up in the morning. And I, I can't sit still without noise. And I, I'm not aware that I'm so empty on the inside that, that I have to have noise on the outside. Because that's not in my conscious mind. That's in my subconscious. And in my subconscious, I'm an empty, craving, desert of void that is so noisy and so empty that the law of equilibrium says I can't have silence on the outside because I'm so miserable, noisy, empty on the inside that I must have noise on the outside. And what a coincidence that seven of the last ten chapters in the book of Revelation say you'll know you're in the end times because Babylon will rule the entire world. And by the way, Babylon, that it was called the nation of Babylon. Before it was called the nation of Babylon, it was called media. What a coincidence. You'll know you're in the end times when all the world is ruled by media. And you can't sit alone for 10 seconds because your heart has been so drowned in lies and then drowned in selfishness, none of which you're aware of. That it's now so noisy that I can't. First thing I wake up in the morning, I have to have noise because the law of equilibrium says, but I'm not aware of all that because that's in my subconscious. Now let's go to those last four scriptures. This is why every single person in the book of Acts prayed in tongues. For if I pray in a tongue, my what? Look at your handout, 1 Corinthians 14, right there in front of you, 1 Corinthians 14. If I pray, and this is still important for you to know, if I pray in a tongue, what prays? Is there anything other way to get your spirit to pray? The answer is no, by the way. The only way to get your spirit to pray is to pray in tongues. It's your mind bypassing your, your, I mean, your body bypassing your mind and calling for the spirit of God and your spirit to pray. And when it prays, we're going to see what happens. Watch Romans, Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing what? Soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the... Now, the things in your heart begin to be exposed. And look at the next passage, Romans 8, 26, 27. Likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the spirit himself intercedes for us with... And that word is untranslatable in the Greek. That word literally means that the spirit himself is groaning. Can you believe that the spirit of God himself would come rising up through your spirit into your heart and that the spirit of God himself would just groan with an ache that this noise and these sins and these lies would be weighing down that which is meant to be pure and clean and bright and alive. This is what's happening when you're praying in tongues. And he who searches the, say it loud, hearts. So when you pray in the spirit, the spirit of God, before it comes to our minds, searches our hearts, knows the mind of the spirit because he intercedes for the saints according to God's will. First Samuel 16, 7, for the Lord sees, not as a man sees, for the man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So tongues is about how you stay refilled because that you cause your spirit to pray and it takes the things in your heart and brings them up into your mind. That's why he says, I will pray with my spirit, then I will pray with my mind. I will sing with my spirit, then I will sing with my mind. So what happens now, it's when you, when you, when you get a heart and heart, it always starts with lies. But when the spirit of God deals with you, he does not start with lies. He always starts with the sins. So the first thing the spirit of God says, you've judged, you've lied, you've cursed, you've hurt this person. So he deals with that sin, says, son, let's repent of that sin. You repent of that sin. And he says, you are clean. You are forgiven. And then the Lord says, now let's go to that lie. Listen, control, lust. It doesn't, it doesn't satisfy. Let's deal with those lies that don't satisfy. And then he says, now you'll be clear and you'll be confident. And then once the lies are gone and the sin is gone, the Lord says, you don't need that noise, daughter. And it gets rid of that noise and let me fill you with my power and my presence. Somebody say amen. amen. Let me close with a story. Let me make you the biggest offer you will ever be made in your life other than salvation itself. 
Story is very brief and simple. It's the first time I ever heard the voice of God. July 1977, I was born again. And I was born again. Is anybody ever going to be born again? I had been a persecutor of Christians for years. I had looked at every other religion. I was was a very antagonistic person, but when Jesus broke me, he showed me nothing in this life will satisfy except him. And I was completely broken, completely sold out for him. And from the second week in July on, I live for this to this day only for Jesus. And for those, those first six months, I mean, I did nothing but work 60 hours a week and read the Bible 30 hours a week. I mean, I just lived for the Lord and I would go to church, go to Bible studies, worship with everything I had, still do, and and, and just just live for him. But I was around some people who were filled with the spirit and they would pray in tongues. And I just, what's that? They weren't, they were very gracious. They weren't forceful. And, but I remember one thing was said to me that to this day impacts me. The, the person I said, why do you pray in tongues? And the person said, if you can worship God in an unknown language, if God can control your tongue, he really controls everything in your life. And I thought, wow, that's, uh, to this day, I'm, I'm aware of the people who are willing to give God your tongue, they'll give God everything. And so, um, I, I like that. But then I really saw in the scriptures, I just went to the word. I said, God showed me in your word. And he immediately showed me these passages, showed me the whole book of Acts, how everyone spoke in tongues. And um, especially I noticed that when they spoke in tongues, they were praising God. That, was, that really impacted me. That every time they said, well, look, listen to them, they're praising God. And so um, I, I, asked, I said, man, I, I want that. And so the first time I said that in a group, it was, it was a bunch of young Christians that they were kind of clutched. They said, well, man, here, sit down in the chair. Let's pray over you. And then they said, just do it. Just do it, man. This is before Nike. This is nine, and they just said, just do it, just do it. And I didn't know what just do it meant. And it just didn't work, if you're honest with you. It's like, just do it, just do it. And so uh, I, I didn't know. So nothing happened. And, and so, but I was thirsty for so much for God. And I was worshiping. And so for the next three, four weeks, I just said, God, I just want everything of you. And the more I saw it in your word. And, and so for the next three, four weeks, I asked God to fill me with the spirit. And, and, I, and, I, and I, I saw something in them that I wanted. And then about four, three, four weeks later, I went to this meeting where this powerful man of God was laying hands on people. He had ministered, and then for like two hours, he laid hands on people, and I was way back in the back of the line. And so I just, I literally was worshiped for two hours with my hands up, just, God, I want all of your spirit. And so when the time he got to me, I had some friends who were in the audience. They said it was kind of funny. He said, PJ, he would lay hands on some people, and some would just waver and lay hands on some people, and they'd fall down. He said, when he laid hands on you, it was like every bone in your body was pulled out, and you, you went straight down like a rag. And I don't remember him laying hands on me. All I know is because my eyes were closed. One minute I'm up, next minute I'm down. And But when I was down on the ground, I was just so, it's like I was in heaven. And I was just so exploding with worshiping him. And I just, English wasn't enough. And I thought, well, I think I'll worship in tongues now. And it was just so much more glorious to worship in tongues. I could have stopped at any moment, but why stop? You know, it's just, oh, I just wanted to worship him with everything in me. And so I worshiped in tongues and I'd worship in English and worship in tongues. And I don't, don't, don't even know how long I was down there. But the next night was the first time I heard the voice of God. And I'm laying in bed, and it's Friday night, and my younger brother, Eric, was four years younger than me. We were very close all the days growing up. And he'd been born again a week. I was the first Christian ever in my family. He was the second. And Eric, my, all my family is really smart, but my brother is super genius. I mean, smartest person I've ever known. My brother, by the time he was 10 years old, had read all 27 volumes of the encyclopedia every page twice, all the way through. And, and, and had almost a photogenic memory. I kid you not, in high school, I would go to Eric and I'd say, I need to uh, write an article on battleships. Can you just tell me what to say? And, he, and I just write it down. He was my Google before there was Google. He's that smart. He had, he had unlimited scholarships to any college in the country he wanted because he made like near perfect on the SAT. Just the smartest person I've ever known. So he's not been a Christian for a week and I'm his, pretty much his closest friend. And so I'm laying in bed and it's like 10 o'clock at night. And he was always out much later than me. And our bedrooms were a converted garage. So we had two bedrooms in the bath in between, way at the other end of the house. And it's 10 o'clock and I, I was just laying in bed reading my Bible. And, and uh, I thought he was out to like midnight and I'm laying in bed. And when God speaks to you, the first time he speaks to you, it's like the ancient of days, but you've heard his, but you know his voice from like you've known it forever. So I'm laying in bed and, and just they're reading. And all of a sudden the Lord says to me, Eric's home. And I, I hadn't heard a thing. It's like, oh, Hi. <laughs> okay <laughs> and so I, I i didn't doubt it but i hadn't heard a thing so i get up and go into the bedroom and sure enough there's eric he'd come in real quietly and he's laying right in the middle of his bed real pensive just crossing his legs and i mean as soon as i came into the bathroom i knew i, I just looked at him and i just knew he's wondering if his intellect is gonna have, he's have to give, give up his intellect to be a christian and i looked at him and said god I'm real new at this Christian thing and he's a lot smarter than me. You're going to have to help me here because I got the impression like, keep moving. 
I didn't say anything. I just knew. I, so I laid down on the bed and put my feet up by his head and put my head down by his feet and just laid there. And it was the sweetest time. And for over an hour, we probably didn't talk six, seven times. I just laid there and after about five minutes, he props up on his elbow and says, hey, John, what do you think about this? And I'm thinking, okay, God, what's your, what do you think? And I, he didn't say anything. It just a thought came to my head. And I went, that's a pretty cool thought, God. So I'd say this, seem to satisfy him. And then another five, 10 minutes, he asked another question. I'd say, all right, your turn. And God would give me a thought and I'd answer him and it really seemed to help him. And it was really kind of fun. I was like the interpreter, you know, and, but, but it wasn't God speaking to me. I just thoughts came to my brain, but this went on for like an hour, just the most peaceful time. But after about an hour, I'm sitting there thinking, no, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to wear out my welcome. So I said, Lord, you know, should we keep going? And clear as a bell. Second thing God ever said to me is, you, you can. You can go now. You've done well, my son. I'm very pleased. And so just like I'd done many other times, I propped up on my elbow. I was just going to say, hey, why don't I head out? I just propped up my elbow. But when I propped up on my elbow, Eric said to me, I don't want to talk anymore, John. Let me just, I need to be alone for a while. And I thought, I knew that. (laughs) I knew you were here. and I knew we were done talking because God told me. (laughs) And if I heard God a hundred thousand times in the last almost 50 years, 900,999 of them have been for someone else. And every time I say, God, will you tell me something about me? He says, no, I don't want to talk about that. He does. I discovered that prophecy is for strengthening, encouraging, and comforting others. And when you're filled with the Spirit, you're a river to flow through to others. So I want to close with an offer that is the greatest offer you'll ever be given other than salvation because I've learned something very powerful about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that is you can't just sit down people and lay hands on them. It's not a switch that you can flick. And the secret is Jesus said, wait seven days. And they waited seven days. So I've discovered that the missing factor is you have to treat every single person as very, very precious. You have to give them a lot of T-I-M-E time. And so up here at the front, I have a six-page packet called Holy Spirit Baptism Questions and Answers. And it has all the doctrinal questions you could have answered. And I've got studies that answer everything you could ever answer and more in-depth studies like this. But on page, question number eight says, what does Pastor John ask before leading someone in the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And it says three things. First, I ask you to meet with me with two, three friends for an hour a day for seven days up here at the church. We will do a seven-day media fast, and during this hour, we'll read the word, we'll just pray, we'll lay, put you, talk about the prayer choices, we'll lay hands on you every day for seven days. We'll talk with you, we'll cover your intercession, we'll just hang with you, we'll love on you, we'll, we'll worship together. We'll find a time during the day when all four or five of us can meet. Some groups meet in the morning, some groups meet at night. It'll be the most refreshing bonding time, and our thirst for Jesus will grow. Number two, since this is the media fast, I have some books or sermons that will fill the time. We'll all read the same books and study the same sermons. They'll give us time to share and discuss. So basically, we'll just have an hour of worshiping and praying and laying hands. And then we'll probably spend a second hour just talking about what we studied that day before and what we read that day before. The first time I did this was 14 years ago with two guys named Pete and Julian. One of them is Julian Gosh. Y'all know Julian. And Pete was in a very, very bad place. His marriage was falling apart and his kids were in a mess. And he's basically... Everything was, and, I, and Julie and I said to him, Pete, if you'll meet up here for seven days, Julie and I will pray with you. I called Pete this week just to say, Pete, I just want to tell you how much that, and, and honestly, the three of us were bonded in the way we've, we've stayed close for 14 years. And he said to me, he said, John, he said, uh, he said, I've never been the same since that week. He said, I still pray an hour a day. I read the word every day. My marriage is fantastic. Even my kids are fantastic. He said, but I got to tell you the truth. I don't remember much about that week. And I said, well, Pete, I'm not surprised because you cried a solid hour every day, every week for seven days. You did nothing but cry. We would lay hands on you and you would cry. And then we would talk and you would cry. There's something powerful about telling someone you are so precious that we will meet with you and we will pray with you and we will care for you and we will pour out the spirit of God on you. And then the third one is very important and it really seems silly and seems funny, but it's very serious. Most of the people I do this get very free in the first day or two. And I say to them, you may get full of tongues and full of spirit in the second day, but you're still going to do all seven days. <laughs> Many are filled with the spirit and receive freedom in tongues in the first, second day, but I ask you to commit to finish all seven days. And I tell people, I said, if I... 
And a lot of this, to be honest with you, a lot of this credit goes to Stefan because Stefan has made my life so easy. I just don't know how, if you know how much Stefan Lorenz has done for me. But my life, I, I mean, I get to do landscaping. <laughs> And I get, to, and, and he's made my life so easy. I get to, because, because he has taken so much off of me that someone said, well, how are you going to find time for this? And I said, if, if for 52 weeks a year, if I have a, a group that meets at 5 a.m. and a group that meets at 7 a.m. and a group that meets at 9 a.m. and another group that meets at 5 p.m. another group that meets at 7 p.m. another group that meets at 9 p.m. and I'm doing six groups a week for 52 weeks, I'll be the richest man that ever walked the earth. Because there's nothing more precious than getting people to come alive in Jesus and filled with the Spirit. So I'm going to close with three prayer requests. I want you to listen very carefully because my question is, are you thirsty for God? Do you want Jesus to be so alive and so real? So if you're thirsty for God, here's, I want you to watch this last PowerPoint. One of your options is to pick up this document, sit at the front, read it carefully, email me, and begin to schedule a time when you, me, and your friends will meet at the church for seven days. Second option is if you're not sure, there's three books, and these are some of the three books that we'll read. All three of these books have sold millions of copies and they're powerful stories. The kind of books, if you started them and you opened up at eight o'clock at night, you're not going to sleep till you're done. Nine o'clock in the morning by Dennis Bennett, they speak with other tongues and, and good morning, Holy Spirit. They are stories that will change your life. And it's like eating like 10 bags of Doritos without any water. They will make you so thirsty. And then the third option is, there's a whole lot of you that you already fill with the Spirit. You already speak in tongues. You already live in this. But I tell you, there's one thing that is sweeter than being filled with the Spirit. And that is helping other people be filled with the Spirit. And so for you, it's like, I'm with you, PJ. You, somebody needs a partner. I'm up here for seven days. You know why camp is so powerful for our kids? Because they get away from Babylon for seven days. They shut off all cell phones, all TV, all media, and they meet with God and their souls get quiet. So if you close your eyes, I want to repeat all three prayer options. If your answer is yes to any of them, you're going to raise your hand at the end. Option number one is, I think that I'm interested in that seven-day thing. I think, just keep your hands down for just a second. Option number one would be, I think I'm interested in that seven-day thing. I want to get that packet. I might want to, you to help me find two, three friends, schedule a time to meet up here for seven days, and just, I want everything of God. Option number two would be, I'm not sure if I'm interested, but I want to get one of those books. And by the way, I'm not going to get the book for you. David says, I won't offer to the Lord that which costs me nothing. I'm actually going to make you buy your own book, the first in the history of Liberty Church. <laughs> buy your own book. Get it on Kindle. I want this to cost you something. I'm going to get some of those books. I'm going to read them. I'm just going to begin to just, just pray about this. So option number one is I'm going to, I'm going to really get that packet and, take, and consider this. Option number two is I'm going to read some of those books. Option number three is I'm already filled with the Spirit, but I would love to help others be filled with the Spirit. If your answer is yes to any of those three questions, hold your hand up real high right now. Lord God, Jesus, I just, you're coming back so soon. You may come back tomorrow. Time is so short. Lord, your word says you're coming back for a pure and spotless bride, not a bride that's weary and beaten down and tired and drained. You're coming back for a bride that is alive and excited and ready for you. Fill us, Lord God. Let the desperation and the depth of the drudgery of this world, let it turn us to be more alive and more excited and more filled with you than we've ever been before. Lord, fill us and let us help others to be filled. Let us lay down our lives that everyone around us may know you and all the goodness and all the power and all the sweetness of God. In Jesus' mighty name, all God's people said, amen. Now, would you do me a favor and turn to the person next to you and say, will you walk with me as we go out to the pergola? <laughs>